So, let's say you're playing Monopoly. How many of you have played Monopoly in your life? Okay, is there anyone here who hasn't played Monopoly? Excellent. A cultural universal. <laughs> so, um, obviously in some ways it doesn't matter if you get all those little hotels. Right? Okay. But, on the other hand, if you act like it doesn't matter while you're playing Monopoly, then people hit you with things, and they should, because part of the rule is you're going to act like this matters. Because if you don't, then it's not any fun. So you have to act like it matters, and then it turns out that when you start playing, it matters. Right? And people will actually, they'll get angry, especially if you cheat. You know, but people will play Monopoly, so they'll act as if the end point matters. And you might say, well, what is the end point? And one answer is to get all the hotels and all the money, so to enter the 1%, so you have all the wealth and no one has any, and you win and you feel happy about that, <laughs> even if you're a radical left-winger, so that's kind of interesting. And so, and, uh, and then you say, well, that's not really the point. The point is to enjoy the game. And you think, yeah, okay, that's probably the point too. Um, and then you might say, well, that's not really the point either. It's like you want to, you want to, you know, hone your negotiating skills. You want to spend some time with your friends. Like, there's lots of things going on at once. And so, but it doesn't really matter because Monopoly is a game that you'll play. Okay. Now, imagine instead that Monopoly, here's the new rule for Monopoly. All the people you're playing with can randomly steal your hotels and houses and your money whenever they want. And you can steal it back. Okay, so then you think, well, no one's going to play that game. And then you think, well, why not? Well, the, the first surface answer is that's a stupid game. <laughs> okay, but, and you know that somehow. You think that's a stupid game. But then you, you're starting to think about, well, why is that a stupid game? Or you might say it's an unplayable game which would be a little bit more sophisticated. It's like, why, why would that not work? And you might say, well, what's the point in getting the hotels if someone can just take them? But you might say, well, what's the point in getting the hotels anyway? It's like, who cares about the damn hotels? So it's, it's a bit tricky. There's something about the randomness of, the, of what's now allowed and the unpredictability of it and the arbitrary nature of it and its lack of a relationship with your own actions that takes all the motivational impetus out of the game. So one thing we might think about to begin with is there's a difference between a good game and a bad game and there's also a difference between a game and no game and we don't know what the difference is exactly but there is a difference and then we might even say well not only are there good games and bad games but some good games are better than other games how many of you have played Settlers of Catan okay <laughs> is that better than Monopoly or worse it's better. Does anybody think it's not better? Okay, why is it better? What's better about it? It's more complex, and part of what you said where you can steal. I mean, it's not necessarily stealing, but there's a piece of the game, I forget what it's called, I think it's like a robber card, or something like that. Yeah, there's a robber, yeah. You place him on one of the tiles, and again... You can mess there. with people. Yeah, essentially. So that's fun. <laughs> it is fun. It is. it is. It's like I'm going to get you with this robber. It's more akin to like real life, I think. Like in Monopoly. Uh huh. I mean, no, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. It's also got a strategic element. How many yeah. of you played Risk? Okay. Settlers of AK-10 or Risk? Settlers. Risk. Who says Risk? risk. Okay. Two Risk. Two Risk diehards. What about the rest of you? How many for Risk? Two. How many for Settlers of Catan? Okay, okay. So, well, Settlers of Catan is quite a bit like Risk because it has a strategic element, right? And there's a, a territorial expansion that goes along with it. And there's also trading, which is one of the things that's nice about Monopoly and about Risk. Okay, but so you can see that you have intuitions about what constitutes a better game. And part of the way that you develop those intuitions is not exactly philosophically, because I doubt if you've really thought through why Settlers of K-Town is a better game, say, than Risk or Monopoly, for those of you that think it is. But you watch your own reaction, and your own reaction is something like, well, I'd rather play Settlers of K-Town. And you might ask yourself why, but you don't have to. You can just rather play it. 
And then, so what, and then you think, well, what does it mean that you'd rather play it? And you'd say, well, it's more fun, it's more enjoyable. Um, if asked voluntarily, that's the one I would pick. But you don't really know why, apart from those reasons. But obviously those are complex. That's a complex social engagement, those games. They're complex. And, and in fact, they're so complex that you can have preferences and not even know why. Now, that's interesting. And I think the idea that there are games... Good games and bad games, and games and non-games, is a nice way of starting to conceptualize what the difference might be between moral systems. Because a game is actually a moral system, right? It, it, it has a point, it has an end. You have to cooperate and compete to, to run through the game. So, a while back, a psychologist actually started this, and, and, and it's reprehensible, but... Psychologists have done, lot, done lots of reprehensible things, and this is one of them. He, this psychologist, whose name I don't remember at the moment, was reviewing the literature on the difference in aggression between boys and girls and men and women. And um, boys and men are much more aggressive, depending on how you define aggressive, than girls and women. Now, that tends actually to be mostly true with physical aggression. So you might say kicking, hitting, biting, punching, stealing. Two-year-old boys, for example, the ones who do two-year-olds, the ones who do most of that are boys. Now, the two-year-old girls are uh, cutting each other up behind their backs, but no one measures that, right? And so you find, for example, with female aggression, it tends to be relationship savaging, and you see that on the in the playground, you see it in junior high, you see it in high school, and you see it on the net. It's always the same thing. So whether men are more aggressive than women is depends on how you define aggression, but men are more physically aggressive, anyways. Um, a while back, there was this idea that maybe we could dim, dampen down the male aggression by socializing little boys more like little girls. So, and, and one of the offshoots of that was the idea that we should only allow children to play co cooperative games. Now, the first thing you might notice is that anything you've ever done that was a game was not cooperative. <laughs> right? Like, it's not a game if it's just cooperative. But then, the other thing you might notice is that the distinction between a cooperative and a competitive game is far more sophisticated than people who come up with those dim-witted theories about how to improve the world would ever appreciate. So here's an example. Is hockey a game? Yes. yes. Is it an aggressive game? Yes. Is it a competitive game? Yes. Is it a cooperative game? Yes. Aha! Why? Why is it a cooperative game? Right? So there's the team, right? Yeah. So you're obviously cooperating with your team members, but you're also maybe trying to be the best player. Yes. But you're also trying to be the best player in a way that doesn't irritate the hell out of your team players, right? Because that's actually, there's something about that that's counterproductive. Like even if you're a good player, if you're a prima donna and you hog the puck, say, and you know, you're not, maybe you're not interested in the development of your other team members, like you're not a good player, even if you're the most talented. So there's definitely a cooperative element. Is there a cooperative element beyond that? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you, you have to uh, all agree to sort of cooperate in so much as, um, you know, agreeing to the rules of the game and playing with it. Right. You don't bring a chessboard or a basketball. <laughs> right. No, you, no matter if you're on different teams. Right. Because you're all there to play hockey. So just to play hockey is a cooperative endeavor because think of all the other things you could be doing instead of playing hockey at that time. You could be doing an infinite number of other things. So really, if you look at the relationship between cooperation and com competition in any collaborative human affair, things are usually competitive at one level, cooperative at another, competitive at another. Like there's this continual interplay between competition and cooperation and you can't disentangle them. Now, one of the things that Piaget said, which Piaget's a for those of you who don't know, and you probably all do know, was perhaps the foremost developmental psychologist of the 20th century, even though he didn't think he was a psychologist. Um, Piaget actually made the claim, the radical claim, that two-year-olds, for example, and this isn't Piaget's claim, but it, it's associated. If you put groups of people together and they're age-matched, so you've got a group of nine-month-olds, say, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, all the way up to 18, and you just throw them in a room, maybe with some things for them to do, and then you count the number of violent acts, which is kicking, hitting, biting, or stealing. Okay? Two-year-olds, they're the most violent human beings. And most of them actually aren't violent. 
There's a subset of them that are violent, about 5 to 10 percent of them, and almost all of those are boys. And then if you track those boys across time, over the next two years, most of them become civilized. And the ones that don't never become civilized. And then, so they're kind of antisocial throughout their childhood, and then when testosterone kicks in at about 14, and all the boys get antisocial again, they catch up to the always antisocial boys, and then the normal boys taper off quite dramatically at around 19 and flatten right out by about 27, but the antisocial boys, they just keep being antisocial. So now, Piaget noted that there was a dramatic transformation in, 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 in behavior, individual behavior in relationship to the social world between the ages of two and four. And if you watch two-year-olds play together, he said that what they did fundamentally was like a parallel play. So maybe there's one two-year-old there and another two-year-old there and that two-year-old is playing truck and this two-year-old is playing ambulance or something or maybe playing doll and they're sitting with each other and maybe they interact a little bit but they're not playing the same game. Okay, so, so what they're doing in some sense is they're, they're engaged in a goal-directed activity it's, it's a, and it, it has a point and they're, trying, they're sort of integrating all their interior sub-personalities in a sense, in a way that allows them to play a single game with themselves. You know, and that's pretty complex from a cognitive perspective, right? Because it, it means there's not, it's, they're not fractionated, and they're not being pulled out by hunger or anger or, or sadness or, or fear or any of those things, and they're doing something that's highly complex cognitively, and they can, they can organize themselves well enough to do it for a substantial period of time. So it's like it's a major developmental advance. But they can't do it with another person. <coughs> Now, one of the Piaget's hypotheses was that they couldn't do it, do, they couldn't play the same game with another person without actually setting up a competitive structure. So that actually comp competition was a prerequisite to cooperation. And so the idea was, okay, so if you watch how kids do this, you can get a, a sense of it. I mean, on the one hand, maybe they, they all get together and they decide to play tag. Okay, and everyone knows the rules for tag, and you can win at tag. But without the point, the point in some sense is the construction of a dominance hierarchy of competence, right? Someone wins, and then there's the people who are sort of second best and third best, and everybody's really into doing that. You all have to get together if you're kids, and you say, well, what should we do? And then you decide, we're going to play tag, and then you set up the rules, because there's infinite variations of tag, and then everyone goes off and plays. And so it's a competitive game because only one person can win, or maybe one at a time can win. But once you've all agreed on that, well, then you're cooperating. So, so that's quite interesting, and Piaget regarded that as a necessary stage in the development of the ability to act like a social creature. And, then, and so here's, here's something that happens if you're not a very popular kid. So let's say four kids are playing jacks. Good enough. I don't think kids play jacks anymore, but whatever. If they were playing jacks, they were sitting there playing jacks, and when you play jacks, you bounce a ball and you pick up a jack, and if you manage that, and the ball. If you manage that, then you drop the ball and you pick up two jacks and you grab the ball and you keep going up to like eight jacks or whatever. So now another kid wants to play jacks, and we'll say this is a relatively popular kid. And so the kid sidles up to the group that's playing and sits down, because they're all sitting down and then watches, and then maybe starts making jack playing motions or a couple of comments about how the jack game is going, and then maybe the other kids don't have to disrupt what they're doing very much, and they can kind of open the circle and let that kid scoot in, and then he gets to or she gets to play jacks too. Whereas a kid that doesn't, and that often doesn't happen, even if it's a popular kid, sometimes the little group that's already formed won't open and let them in. You've been at cocktail parties. It's exactly the same thing, right? It's exactly the same thing. So you're supposed to hang around the edge of the conversation, and maybe if you've got something that isn't too stupid to say, you can <laughs> offer it, and maybe they let you in, right? So, okay, so now if you're not very social, what you do is you stand out there, and you don't notice what the hell's going on, and you don't start to match your body to what's happening, and maybe you say, I don't want to play jacks. That's a stupid game. Let's go do something else, in which case the kids are not happy with you, and you're unpopular. And that's that. You're stuck with it. Because if you've got that by the time you're four, about the other kids are going to leave you so far in the dust, you're never going to catch up. Okay, so, so what, have, what have we concluded from that? We might conclude that um, people play games. There's lots of different games. Um, there's lots of different playable games. 
There might even be an infinite number of playable games. There's a lot of non-playable games. Those are the ones that aren't any fun. And there's a lot of interactions that aren't games. Okay, so we can all accept that. And then we've added to that the observation or the presupposition that the ability to play games is a prerequisite for being socialized, so being able to operate together with people, and that that operation has elements of competition and elements of cooperation. Reasonable? And then you might say, well, everything people do communally has a game-like aspect. And you might say, well, that's actually why kids like to play games. Because kids play games because games are a simplified analog of life. And if you get good at playing games, well, what happens is the games you play become increasingly complex and more and more real-world-like until they're actually indistinguishable from acting in the world. But they're, even then, they're still games in a sense because they could, the rules could be different. But then what, the rules could be different. But then you might think, well, are there things that couldn't be different? And yeah, there are some things. It's going to be cooperative. It's going to be competitive. There's going to be rules. Everybody needs to agree on the rules. People have to want to play. This is something else Piaget observed. It's bloody brilliant. He thought, well, how could you decide if one game is better than another? And that's a moral, let's say that's a moral claim in a sense, okay? But he, he wanted to narrow it down so that it was possible that it could be answered. And what he said was, okay, well, imagine you have group A that are attempting to attain a goal and group B that are attempting to attain a goal. Both groups have agreed that attaining the goal is valuable. We don't have to argue about the value of the goal. We've settled that. Okay, now we're going to make a further assumption, which is all things considered, getting towards the goal with less effort, more enjoyment, and less trouble would be better. Okay, you have to take that as a given, because it might not be. Sometimes something difficult is better. But Well, then you might say, okay, would people working voluntarily or involuntarily be more likely to reach that goal with less misery, faster, and more effectively? And Piaget's answer was, if you can get people to play the game voluntarily, you don't have to waste effort on enforcement. No one kicks back, so the system is going to be more efficient across time. Now that's, that's smart. Because he's got a, he's got a way of conceptualizing what might constitute a better system. Now, it's grounded in subjective experience to some degree, less misery, more enjoyment. Um, but there's also a way of measuring it, which is it's also more efficient, you know, or it does what it's supposed to do with less noise and grief, less cost, let's say, something like that. So that's, that's pretty smart. Okay, so then let's, let's make another, well, hmm, how old do you think kids' games are? Like, and I don't know what's happened to kids in recent years because their, their culture in some ways has been seriously disrupted by television and computers. But you guys are a lot younger than me. Did you play hide-and-go-seek? Okay. Do you know Ring Around the Rosy? You know that. Do you know what that is? You don't know Ring Around the Rosy. How many people don't know that, that Ring Around the Rosy, pocket full of posies, hasha, hasha, we all fall down? Okay. How many know that? Okay, it's an English nursery rhyme. It's about the plague. It's about the black plague, by the way. And so that piece of doggerel, that piece of rhyme, has been around, transmitted by the oral culture of children since the time of the black plague. And so a lot of children's tradition is an oral tradition, and a lot of the games that children play are passed along by children. You know, adults might also teach them, but kids learn how to play hide-and-go-seek. And how many of you played tag? Right. Ever, anyone never play tag? Right. So everyone plays tag. What, how would you conceptualize tag if you were a biologist? What do you think children are doing? Well, they're hunting. Right. They're chasing things down. Obviously, they're chasing things down. Now, hide and go seek. Well, that's a tougher one, but it's certainly exploration. They're exploring a landscape, right? And they're matching wits against one another, but. And they're also trying to see if, you know, do people like you enough to actually find you, which is a <laughs> helpful thing to know if you're four years old. So, anyways, children pass these games down across, <laughs> let's say, across the centuries. Um, and maybe tag is one of those games that you wouldn't even have to pass down. Children might just invent it spontaneously with every generation. Because like, you can more or less play tag with a dog. You know, I mean, the dog doesn't quite get it. But, but, <laughs> but it's close. Okay, so, 
So there are some games that are, that are enjoyable enough so that they're, they're either transmitted and everyone learns them very rapidly, or they're, they're so close to our nature that we can just reinvent them. And tag, I think, is the, the classic example of that. So, so that's interesting, too, because what it means is that there are certain types of competitive and cooperative behavior. Those are elementary moral systems that are, they look like they're integral to our nature. Now, you could even say they're built right in, or you could say they're so close to built in that it doesn't take much of an introduction to the rules of the game before everybody's pretty happy with it. And you, you see this with a lot of things. You play peekaboo with a baby. Okay, so what are the rules? What are the rules of peekaboo? What's that? You cover your eyes. You cover your eyes. Yeah, okay, so that's right. So you go like this. Okay, then what's the next rule? Your That's your right, you reveal your eyes. You don't just sit there like this. <laughs> now, you know, you can play a trick on a baby if you want. And babies will laugh about this sort of thing, which is really, I think, really quite amazing. The baby's laugh is something remarkable to me. So you can go like this, and then like this, and then like this. And then like this, and then you can do this, and the baby will laugh. That's, <laughs> that's a little variation, eh? Or you can go like this. <laughs> right, and then the baby, well, even that'll even make you guys laugh. So that's, that's good. You can see how, how deeply rooted this is. So, you know, but eventually, what will the baby do? It, it'll grab your hands, right? Pull them down, because you're breaking the damn rules. And the baby knows the rules, even though you've never established any rules. And you can get the rules going with about five reps, right? You say, okay, this. Maybe you, no one's ever played peekaboo with the baby. It figure, the baby figures it out right away. This, this. And then you vary that. Maybe you do that. That baby thinks that's a hell of a good joke, you know, because he went up instead of down. And so it's variations within this rule-bound theme. It's kind of like musical in a sense, right? It's variations within the theme. Now, what you don't do is go, Whoa! because the baby, that'll just short it right out, right? You know? So you don't do that unless you're, you know, <laughs> unless, you, unless you have an evil streak in you. So there's, there's certainly ways of violating the baby's expectations. And you, what the baby will do if you do that is startle, and they startle with their whole bodies, and then look at you, and then probably they'll burst into tears. But some babies will just laugh like mad if something like that happens, and you can find those babies all over YouTube, right? Because, you know, you get the baby that the mother sneezes and the baby has a fit laughing for like 10 minutes, you know, so... But it's quite interesting. Like, uh, one of the things about babies I've never been able to understand is the staggering sophistication of their senses of humor. Like, and it's, like, it's deep, eh? Because even a nine-month-old baby can play tricks on you. So, you know, they're baby tricks, but still, they're tricks, and they laugh, and, you know, they're quite comical, and they like variation. So anyways, the point is, the point, one of the points of all this is these, these, this understanding of game-like structures is really, 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 really deep inside of us. And it's way before articulation. You know, artic it's way before we can say the rules. Babies can pick up the damn rules right away. And it's kind of a dance in some sense. And a dance is also a rule-bound structure. Like, if you're dancing with someone well, there's rules like don't step on their feet, but you also set up a set of expectations in the dance and then you violate them in tandem. And if you can do it gracefully, then it's fun, you know, and, and maybe the person you're dancing with can figure out if you're an absolute klutz and, you know, so autistic that you can't even get outside of yourself and might make a half reasonable partner or if it's just hopeless. So, but the, the dance is the same thing. It's not negotiated verbally. It's negotiated bodily. And unless we were able to imitate, and imitate insanely well, because human beings can imitate like mad, we wouldn't be able to do that. And so babies are the same way. You basically start, the, you don't actually, peekaboo doesn't have rules. Because a rule is a stated description of a set of expectations. What, what peekaboo has is expectations and repetition. And you can violate the expectations, but that doesn't mean you're breaking the rule, because an expectation is not a rule. It's not a rule until you observe the expectation, you describe what it is, and maybe you even write it down. And you can play games long before, long before you can follow rules. And one of the things Piaget observed is if you take kids, if you watch a bunch of kids playing a complicated game like marbles, and they're like six, and you take them out of the game and you ask them what the rules are, they can't tell you. Or they maybe get some of them right and a bunch of them wrong. Maybe if you interviewed every child that was playing, 
and you looked at the commonality of description, you could extract out the underlying rule structure of the game. But the kids don't know the rules. What they know is how to play with other kids when they're playing marbles. And a lot of that's, you know, nonverbal hints and eyebrow raises and no, you can't do that and, and so forth. And it isn't until much later that they can tell you the rules, if ever. So, like, you know, you guys can't tell me the rules for dancing successfully with someone. You can tell me some stupid things you shouldn't do, but you imagine how complex it is. It's very, very difficult to articulate out the whole structure, but you can sure tell when it's happening, and you can sure tell when you're not doing it, or maybe your partner isn't. So partly what that also means is you know how to do things that you don't know how you know how to do. And you know how to do all sorts of things that you don't know how you know how to do. In fact, most of what you know is like that. And so that also means that we can be playing games that are extraordinarily sophisticated and that maybe are rooted way back in history that we don't understand. But that doesn't mean, like that we can't describe at least, we don't have an articulated knowledge of the structure, but we can still play them. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but you might know it. Uh, a while back, 20 years ago, about that, those massive online multiplayer games started to become popular. And, uh, you know, some of them, I think, although I don't know this for sure, some of them lasted a long time, and maybe some of them are still being played, like the early ones. You know, so they developed entire worlds in there, and, you know... Um, there was an economist who became quite famous because of those games, Castroneva, I think his name was, Edward Castroneva, I think that's right, but it's close. Anyways, <clears throat> he tried, he thought, hey, look, man, those aren't games, those are countries. And so one of the things he tried to do was to calculate their gross national product. And, you know, you can trade items in those little worlds, right? And you could, you could sell them on eBay, for example, and for a while, in this one game, and maybe this still happens, there were young people in the Philippines who were working inside these games making artifacts that they were selling on eBay to other game players because they could make more money doing that than they could actually working in the actual world. Hmm. Well, and so Castronova, I think was his name, said, well, you, you don't get it. That is the real world. Like, that's not a game. Or if it's a game, it's so much like the world that it's part of the world. And so he calculated the gross national product of some of these massive games. And like they were like the 30th richest country in the world. It was insane. You know? And so that's interesting, you know, because that also shows you that the, the line between a game and reality is not clear. So here's another example of that. It's something worth thinking about. Um, some of you have no doubt played very complex multiplayer online games, and I suppose those, more often those are adventure games or quest games, and you have to communicate with other people, and you have to solve problems, and you have to, you know, maybe you have to defend yourselves. It's like you're an exploratory party in a new world, something like that. And so it's pretty sophisticated. Now, okay, and some of you have worked at McDonald's or another fast food restaurant. How many of you have worked at a restaurant? Okay, how many at a fast food restaurant? Okay. Would you say that an online game is more like the world or less like the world than your job at a fast food restaurant? More. more. It's more. Okay, anybody disagree? Okay, why is it more like the real world? Because you're doing more complex stuff. Than what, what, what are you doing? Uh, you're exploring, you're thinking, you're getting out of situations. You always have new situations coming up and you're dealing with them and you're learning, uh, fast food is like uh, you're doing the same. Right, you're a real cog in a fast food machine, right? Yeah. yeah, but it's in the real world. Is it a game? You're more like a machine in the fast right, food. Right, 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 right. So, so does yeah. that mean that McDonald's is less real than a uh, multiplayer online game? It's less cognitive. Complex. Well, it's a tough one, eh? Because when you're trying to think about what real means, yeah. is you might think, maybe I phrased that wrongly. I, maybe I could say... Is McDonald's a worse model of the real world than a multiplayer online game? And it's hard because it's hard to say that McDonald's isn't part of the real world. So, like, a priori, the claim is kind of absurd. It's like, well, you're in a building, people actually come there, they give you money, it's real. But then, well, you think about these complex games and you think, well, you're practicing extraordinarily sophisticated forms of social and intellectual behavior and we actually don't know what that does to people. Maybe it makes them extraordinarily sophisticated and social. I do think that it helps with introverts quite a lot. 
you know, because introverts, it's harder for introverts to become extremely socially fluid because people wear them out. But a lot of introverts do a lot of heavy-duty socializing on the net, and my experience has been that it's, you know, all things considered, it's probably a plus rather than a minus. 